Welcome to section five, structs. By the end of this section, we will learn what is a struct, how to declare a struct, how to use structs. We'll look at more advanced uses of structures, and we'll look at anonymous fields, nested structures, structures and methods, and finally, we'll look at structs and function. And this is where we're gonna talk about what happens when you copy structures, essentially. Every time we talk about some data type and functions, it's, well, what happened when you copy it. So let's start at the beginning. Introduction, lecture one. We will look at what is a structure, how does that compare to arrays, slices, and maps? And then we look, of course, at some simple use cases of why you might want a structure, why a structure is useful. So let's start with a definition. And this is taken from the Golang documentation. It says, a struct is a sequence of name elements called fields each of which has a name and a type. Field names may be specified explicitly or implicitly. Within a struct, non-blank field names must be unique. Now that's a lot to chew on. So we'll just keep that in the back of our heads for now. But before we can embark on learning something new, it might help for us to sort of revisit some of the things we've already learned so that we can sort of compare and contrast. Let's start with the first collection type we look at, and those were arrays. And we saw how you can declare an array as, let's say, any number of a certain type. And we have the index to the elements of that array. One of the features of an array is that it has flexible element type, meaning that for our element, we can use any type so long as all the elements are going to be of that type. So when we say we have an integer array, every element is an integer. We have boundaries. So boundaries are enforced for us so that we do not go out of bounds for the array, either trying to access things that are early in the array or beyond the end of the array. And we have integer indexing in the form of the zero, one, and so on. So non-negative integer indexing. When we come to slices, it looks very much like an array, but here we have some of the same features. We use a slice the same way we use an array. So we have element types that are same, but now we have something that can actually grow beyond the initial size. And of course, we still have the ability of indexing with the restriction that our index must be non-negative integer. We then look at maps, and maps give us a few flexibilities. One, the values in a map, like an array and a slice, must all be of the same type. But when it comes to the indexing, no, we can actually use negative numbers for indexing, if our key type is an integer, or we can use a string for indexing, Boolean, even though that wouldn't be very exciting because you only have two possible values as a key. But at least we see it all, there are many more things we can use. There are restrictions, however. We cannot use a map as the key, neither can we use a function value as a key. And there's one other thing we can't use, like a channel, which we haven't learned about yet. But besides that, string, floats, all those can be used as keys. Here we see that oh, for our element type, it's flexible so long as all are the same type. That's where we have this idea of arrays, slices, and maps are like containers, right? You could put multiple values in, but we see that oh, it's resizable. And then we have the big benefit of a map, which is the flexibility in the indexing type. So in order to understand structures and the benefits of structures and what they give us that's so different from what we've seen so far, let's sort of look at a problem that we might have some data. Let's say I give you this table, a list of people, individuals, and let's call it our people database. And I ask you to store it in a program. So you have the first name, last name, social security number, and their age. If we now tack on the type for each of these fields, we'll see that for the first name, last name, and social security number, we can easily represent those as strings. The age, however, we would like to use the most appropriate type, and that seems to be an unsigned int 8 value. If we want to store this information using the data types we have today, well, what might we want to do? We'll have to say that age cannot be represented as an int 8, but rather as a string. And if we can represent age as a string, then we can say that to represent a person, we'll say a person is a slice of string because now we can use multiple strings to represent one individual. And for our database, we'll simply say our database is simply a slice of slice of string. And we can sort of simplify things by type defining a person to be a slice of string. So that way, all the information for one person is its own slice. And then we can simply say that the database is a slice of person. So that makes it a little bit more readable. 
but it doesn't really solve our problem. Notice we had to sweep something under the rug, which was that age, which is an integer, we had to treat it like a string in order for us to be able to use the data types that we have so far, which is the collection, either a map or a slice, we'll have the same problem because each one of the things that we want to store together are of different types. So we had to do some type coercion. So what we would really like is the ability to say, no, I have some string values and I just so happen to have an integer values. And what I want to be able to do is say that oh, these types have values and I want to give name to them because if I have several strings, how do I tell them apart if I couldn't give them names? So I want to name each one of these fields. And so for that, this is where the field name comes in. This is where the type comes in. And this is where the value comes in, where we say each field has a type and it also can have a value. And so what a structure is, is a umbrella under which you can put all of these different things. So a structure allows you to say that oh, you have name fields. And if we look back at what the definition for what a structure is, it says a structure is a sequence of named elements. And this is my sequence of name element. First name, last name, social security number, and age. That's the, the sequence of named element. I'm naming each element. Unlike when we use array, maps, and slices, we could not name our elements. We simply said that we have elements of a certain type, and that was it. Now, in maps, we had a key. For example, we could have used first name or something. Instead, if we had a key for age, you use age as a key, remember, we couldn't store an integer in our map. Everything in our map would have to be of the same type, so we'd still have to coerce our age into a string. With a struct, no, age can be of type int. And we call those named elements the fields, and then each field has a name and a type. Now that we've illustrated the problem, let's take a look at some code. And I have a main.go file. And in my command line, you can see I am in that directory already. But what I would like to do is start with a piece of example code that we wrote in section four in lecture one. Specifically, we wrote this when we started looking at maps. And so I'll copy this code to get us started. And to illustrate the problem, I'll paste it here. And so for now, I'll close our editor here to give us some more space. I'd like to make some changes first. If you remember, we said that we had a people's database. So let's call this database, for example. And we have some people in it, of course. And for now, let me simplify things a little bit. It doesn't change much what we're doing. It just simplifies the code because I'll be writing a bit more code. Let's run our example. And so just as before, we have the Smith family. Um, members of the Smith family is Mary, John, Pete, and Anne and the Jones family because they're not in our database yet, and this is a map, we can look them up still, there's nothing there, an empty slice. So what we said was if we have a slice, notice we have a map that's a slice of string, and we can add members to a family. But the problem, and this is without structs, that here for Mary, we can only send this as a string for each person. We cannot represent Mary's age. We can certainly say or just string represent our full name, Mary Smith, for example, but social security number, where should we put that? So if we wanted to represent a person, what we said we'll have to do. And so this now sort of gets us a little bit closer. Of course, notice we couldn't include the age because age is of type in. So instead of having to make a slice for a person, what I think we should do is simply say that we want to have a function that returns a person and we can append them probably to this family list. So maybe what we should do is have something like Mary and pass the information for Mary. Before I write the new person function, which is just going to create a new person and return it. So we understand it's going to take this parameter, create a new person slice, return it as a slice of string, which is a person is, as we defined it up here. We have now Mary is a person, John is a person, Pete is a person, Anne is a person. And since in our database, we are making a... Okay, so our database is actually... So that wasn't correct. So 
a family is a collection of individuals. And if we say an individual is a collection of string, then a family is just a collection of individuals. Now we can also say that really what we have here is a map of last name to family. And so a last name is a string, right? So we, we can certainly do that. And it's sort of same thing, but it's sort of make it more explicit what we're doing. But anyway, so we make a person. And so in our database, we use in a string or our last name to look up that family. Once we have a family, which we know is just a slice where we can use the append function to say, append onto that family, whatever the value is, all these other elements. And we know it all, this is a variadic function that takes multiple values to append to the slice. And so of course you have to save the result. This is going to work if so long as I write my new person function. Once I write my new person function, which takes four string values and return the correct type, then I am good. So let's write that now. I'm not sure why it's saying that it's not used because I clearly have Mary here and I have Mary here. So, oh, so this is why, because this is database. It was a little bit confused. Okay, so now the error message went away. So let's run our code and see what happens. And so this is what we expect. We expect a family is just a slice of individual and an individual or a person is just a slice of string. So we can see this is one person here, John. This is another person, Mary. And each of these is just a slice of strings. That's why we see the array-like syntax around it. And it doesn't appear here that we're using a string for our age, but we know that we are because we can see that here. So this is without struct. We'll have to do something like this. And certainly if we wanted to take the average age of anybody in a family, well, we have to convert each one of these string values to an integer first before we do some comparison. So that's what I meant when we were talking about in the slides, why we're sweeping under the rug that we are actually dealing with an int. And a struct solved this problem for us. What a struct allows us to say is that if I have a person, and so I'll rename this because this is sort of wasted on this type. So what I'll call this is person hack. And the reason why I'm calling it a hack is because this is a hack if we had to do this in our code. This is not what we really intend. This is not what we really want. Same thing with family. This is a hack. And this database map into this type of family, well, this is a hack too. If we, there's something we want to do in code and there's no explicit easy way to do it and we have to jump through hoops, we tend to say that oh, we've just hacked the code or we've written a hack. So this is not correct. It's not the best way without structs. This is the way we would have to do it. And we'd say, oh, this is a hack, all right, to get around what we really want to do. So what we really want to do is to use a struct. And with a struct, what we really want to be able to do is say that we have somebody's name. Let's say somebody call Max. And we want to be able to say Max, that first name is equals to Max. We want to be able to say Max, that last name is equals to whatever Max's last name is. Maybe he's part of the Jones family. Max social security number is that and Max's age, right? Something like that. And so the way we get this, because what we're doing is we have something, some object on which we can access each field by specifying a name. So if you remember from the definition of what a structure, it says named fields. So how do we declare this? We can say var max is a struct with some name field. How do we specify the name field? We put it in open and close curly braces and we simply list out the field names. And remember each field name has a type. And that's all there is to it. We have just declared and read this. Variable max is a struct and the struct has these named fields with these corresponding type. And notice how we are able to create one entity. It's like a collection. We're able to bucket all these things together, these pieces of data in one thing and one entity, but they have different types. We could have included height or weight, which is a float, for example. If you wanted to be able to say somebody is five feet, eight inches, you might put that down as five, eight. And so this is completely valid. And now if we print this out to see how Go understand this, And let's run our code again. 
and you can see it says max and it put curly braces around it and it print out the values for our fields of course this looks very different than how it prints out an array with an array it uses square bracket for a struct it uses curly braces and it tells you that the type of this is a struct with these field and names and type notice that how the type of it is printed out let's put the new line here we know that in go the way to turn this into a type is simply to replace this var with the keyword type you can say that though this represent a person so instead of having to type this each time let's say we wanted to create another person angela we would have to do the same thing so instead of doing that we can simply say type person this is much more what we want to be able to do and so now we can say var max is a person and if we didn't initialize this each field will simply take on the zero value of that type or the default value for that type so strings are going to be empty strings numerics will have the value zero boolean will be false and so on and within a struct you can put any type including function type a map if you have to whatever you want so let's say for example you want to be able to say that a person might have multiple middle names you might do is a slice of string right and if they have multiple phone numbers and you want to use a map for that well you can also do that and this would allow you now to say this is a work phone and the phone number, mobile phone, fax number, all that sort of thing. So all these different types can still be part of this struct. So structs are truly very powerful type of data structure. All right, so we'll simplify things though and leave it like this. And so now that we have a person like this, now we can certainly revisit our database and say, why don't we redo our database? in terms of person. I will move this type now up to the top. And so we don't need the type keyword. I can say that a database is just a map of our family. It's just a slice of person. And similarly, like we had before. And we have something similar to this. So let's copy this and move it down. And this time, uh, let's call it database two, for example. But this time, we're saying that we have a map of slice the family. So we still need to use make because we're using a map. And by default, a map is nil. So we still need that. One of the things we want to do is create another function which creates a person. This time, it's not creating a slice of string, but rather a struct object let's call that person two for example and we'll keep that around just so our program can still work but this time we know that our age is not a string so we can make that a separate parameter that's appropriate and now we're returning an actual person not a hack of a person And of course, now this parameter is invalid. We can now pass the proper types that are expected. But now our variables are incorrect. So let's fix that. And so we have Mary2, Annie2, and so on. But let's run this now and see what we get. Clear our screen. Run the program. So now we see that this is working. We can now ask ourselves, what does it look like when we print out our entire database. But before we print out the entire database, let's add some members to the new family. So for Jones, for example, we will put Max as a member of the Jones family. So essentially this means look up the Jones family, whatever you find as that value, let's append a member. And in this case, we only have Max to append. If we had multiple members, of course, we would put those. And then store that result back in the location within the map, database two using this key and so we can print out each individual family and we know what that looks like but what if we print out the entire database and so that's database two and let's run it and as you can see this is the entire database notice it says map and within our map we have a key smith and the value notice the colon so this is the key and then this is the value that comes next 
the key is a slice and then within that slice are elements which are structs. We know those are structs because we see the curly braces and these are their value followed by another struct value. And so we now have that this is the entire slice or the Smith family. And then notice the next key is Jones. Probably can't see it on my screen properly. So key Smith, key Jones. And this is the value, which is again, is a slice of person object. And so very nested and deep data structures we're doing now, but at least you can see the benefit of being able to use something like a struct to take care of having multiple fields, each field having a different type. And that is a structure. Before we end this lecture, let's take a look at what we've learned today. You saw how to declare a structure. You saw how to assign value and look up values from it. And that is all part of using structure. Definitely look at the Go language specification on struct types. That's it. Thanks for your time. See you in the next lecture. Take care. Have a great day. For this exercise, let's close this off. I want to look at the solution, but the stub. And what you're going to do is use some data that I grabbed from the web, and it's about the largest cities in the world. Now, the data is pretty simple. Let's take a look at what that data looks like. So in the solution part, exercise one, okay, cities. Let's copy that and put that in the stub also. So this is what the data look like. It has header, which has city, the country name, and population data for the metropolitan area around that city. And so what I'd like you to do is write a Go program, given this comma separated value file that does the following. Your program should read the records from this file. The program name that you're going to read the data file should be passed to your program as an argument. If it's not passed to your program, you should handle that case correctly and show them the correct usage. And so you turn those from a comma separated string value into an object. And then you have to find some way of storing each of those records. And once you find that, the only thing I want you to do is go through that list and print out the countries which have five or more of the largest cities in this list. That is all you have to do. And if you think about this problem, if you index it properly using a map, you can answer this question very easily. So you want to use a map to index the data. That's a tip. And of course, you want to store each record appropriately because what if someone asks you now to find the total population or the average population within a country or across countries or something like that? Then you have to be able to find that information very easily. Definitely want you to follow the requirement and you must use a structured type to represent the record from the file. And you should consider using more than one file readability. And so I tell you a little bit of where I get the sample data. If you want to go look at it and get some more, that's up to you. That is the exercise. And of course, the solution is provided. If you're stuck, take a look at that. Welcome to section five, lecture two, advanced struct usage. So in this lecture, we're going to be looking at structure initialization. We'll talk about how you can nest structures, that's structure within structures. We'll also talk about anonymous fields. Uh, when to use them, some of the drawbacks, and so on. And we'll look at how you can use basic types. Those are your string and ints as anonymous fields. How you can embed other structures using anonymous fields. And then once you start embedding structures as anonymous fields, you can run into some issues with how do you access the field names or the fields within those embedded structures. And then how you deal with ambiguity. The best way for us to understand this, I think, is to just go look at some code. So here I am in my Visual Studio editor, and what I have is nothing too complex in terms of writing up some code is the outline of the program and this struct that I call address. And address has two fields, street one and street two. And so let's start by looking at some ways to initialize structures. So we know that if you declare a variable of type struct, you can start assigning values to the fields. So what I've done is I've declared a variable a0 of type struct, and I've assigned some values to its field, and now I want to print it out. And notice I'm using pong v. What this means is to show me the field name of the type. So let's run this code and see. What it's telling me is that I'm printing out a value for a type that's defined in the main package and the type is address. But notice here the field name colon and the value. Now, interestingly, 
when you use the pong v what you're really saying is go print the result in a way that i can use to declare a variable of this same type with the values so actually if you copy this you go back into your code and you do something like so we're already in the main package so i don't need to use main here and of course i want to print this out again what you understand now is that we're able to use a0 after we declare it and we first declare it then we assign values to it then we can optionally do it this way where we say we have a struct and we can specify which fields we want to initialize what if we only wanted to initialize some of the fields By naming the field, we can say which field we want to initialize. And so this allows us to only initialize street two field for this struct without initializing street one field. Now, the reason why you might want to do this is if you have a very complex structure, you might only want some of the fields initialized because the other default values are appropriate for whatever you want to do. Another thing to keep in mind is that, let me grab this. where we did not name the fields, but simply specify the values, relies on you specifying the values in the order in which the structure was declared. Whereas when you name the fields, you can name them in any order. For example, I can move this from here and put it at the end. Of course, I need my comma in between. But now I get the exact same values as A1, even though I have them in different order because I've named the field. So these are some of the ways you can initialize a structure. So there's one other thing that you should be aware of when it comes to initializing a structure field. And that is, let's say I wanted to put this on multiple lines. Like I had several values, fields, sorry. Let's say I had a very long initialization list and I want it to be on several lines. So, can I do this? Can I put this on one line? That still works fine. Separate this also on another line. And notice I don't have an error. It still works. But watch what happens when I put this on a line by itself. This might look neater, but we have an, an error here. It says I expect a comma. So even though there's no other field that comes after this line, you must put a comma at the last field. And we'll see the same thing when we start doing nested structure in a bit. You must put a comma on the last field, even though if it's on a line by itself. And that's just a requirement. So there's no point in trying to understand why it is that way. Okay. So just for parsing, if you put this closing parentheses on a separate line, then it must be a comma here. So that's just one thing to note that might sometimes get you. But if it ever happens, you'll see it because your code is not going to compile. So let's talk about nested structures. So let's say I have an address and now I want to add a person struct that says a person have an address. So in this case, I have age, which is of type age, and I do not have that declared yet, but let's just say that I could put this anywhere, but I'll put it here. And let's say the type of an age is on sign eight. Okay, so that takes care of that. Here we have this field address, which is of type address. So now we have nested one structure within another structure. So how do we initialize a person now that we have a nested structure? So we know that we can type person and then we can initialize it. So this is similar to this right here, where we create a address object and assign it to a variable. So I'm doing the short assignment, of course, here instead of typing var. So I'm going to create a person and assign them to P. Now, right now, my structure is empty. This is the exact same thing as if I did var person. They're both exactly the same. So now I can print out my person P. And of course, we can run the code and we can see this. And so here is person and has a field first name, last name, social security number, age, and address. Notice our address field is of type main that address, which we know from before that the addresses are defined in main. And these are the field for main. And notice how it's printed out. Again, like I said, we can copy this and use this to assign our person object or create a new person object. But before we use it, what if we try to use the way of initializing a field, which is by assigning values to it? Let's say we want to do this. 
we're going to assign John as the first name, Doe as the last name, no social security number, and an age value of 45. Our intention is to leave address field empty because we don't know this address. If you notice, I'm getting an error for this. And the reason is because it says too few field value. Once you start specifying values for a struct like this in the initialization list, you must specify all the values. If you want to just specify a subset of values, then you must use named field. This is illegal. Let's comment out this. And instead, we'll use this. And so by having named fields, and now let's put it on multiple lines. No, we don't need main because we're in the package main. And notice how for my name field for address, I had to say that I'm assigning the value of address structure. So this looks just like a declaration. We could have easily have pulled this out, assign it to a variable, and then just simply use the variable here. So now we can assign values. And of course, since I have no values for John's address, I can simply take this out and just simply say, I'm assigning an empty address. But like I said, since we're doing name field, I can choose to leave out the fields that I do not have a value for. So doing it this way also works. And notice I do not get a warning here. Now I want to put back something for just a minute to show you the issue with those commas and putting things on a new line. So let's say I want to make this even nicer and I decide to just do this and then this like this. And then I put a new line here and of course it's going to complain. So we learned from before, even the last field needs a comma. So we put a comma there and now I want to continue. I put a new line there. Notice what happened. This is seen as a field, which it is. It just the, the field value happened to be a nested structure. But this is also a field, so guess what? You need a comma here also. But in this case, since we're not assigning a value, I want to take it out. I'll keep it on multiple line because it looks neater that way. So that allows us to initialize our structure. And notice, we use the exact same way we initialize other structure. It doesn't matter if they're nested members, we just do the same thing. To complete our example with nested structure, let's create a second person. Let's call him Sam and also give him an address. So we know that to create a person for Sam, we'll need to say struct name person and give it an initialization list. In this case, we are going to use name field assignment, but we can also take out the field name so long as we specify them in the correct order. Remember, if we are going to specify them without the field name, we have to specify all the values, including saying that at this field's position, we have a struct address. Let's put these in different lines so it's a little bit easier to read. So as you can see, we are able to initialize explicitly the nested value for Sam is, is address. So we could run this if we want to see the result, but we know that it should work. We don't have an error in our code. And as you can see, there it is. So let's now talk about anonymous fields. So let's imagine I wanted to create another struct called city. And so city would have a name. And of course, city belongs to some state. So I can say, which state does the city belong to? And I can also have a struct to represent that state. So something like that. Just as before, we had person, then we had address nested within person. Well, now we can have city and nest the state struct within city. So where does the anonymous field come in? Well, one of the things we can do is say that, you know, since we only have one string in this field, I don't actually need to name it. I can leave it without a name. And also, since we have one state, again, I don't have to name it. I can just simply just say that I have a state. And what that means is that now, notice I don't have an error in my code. My fields are anonymous. So how do I use an anonymous field? And so no surprise, it's exactly the way how we declare a person. We say we had the first field was a string. So we put that value. And since we are listing out the value without naming the fields, well, we must specify all the fields value. And so then the second field in our city was a state. So I have to get a state value. And we can run our code and this works. What about if we wanted to name our field? How do we access this? How do we say we want to print the city's name, for example? And notice when I type C that, I am offered some options. So I'm offered name, 
amorphous state and amorphous string. Where is name coming from? Well, we'll get back to that in a bit. But we know that string field of the city struct is where I intend to place the city name. So I'll use that. And state, we didn't have a field for states, but there's the only place where name would come in. I'm being or for name, why not use that? Let's see if I get the state name. So if I run my code, you'll see that when I use string here, as though it's a field name, well, it's anonymous. Since my city only have a string and a state, I could afford to not give them name because it's clear that if I say city.string, I'm talking about this field. And if I say city.state, I'm talking about this field. Of course, we were able to use city.name. That's because since we have this nested or embedded structure, what Go is giving me or allowing me to do is access the field of this structure as though it was part of city. Now that might seem a bit confusing. So in a way, Go is delegating to the, when you say see that name, it's delegating to a nested structure that has that name. So you need some time to read up on it and practice it. But so that's where this name is coming from. And that's why when we run our code, we see that how it says New York, because this is a shorthand for saying see that state that name. So let me show you what I mean. These two lines print exactly the same thing. I can say see that state that name and it's the exact same thing i get the same result in both lines so the first line allow me to just save some typing so you can imagine this could lead to some ambiguity when you have multiple nested structure and they all could potentially have the same field name especially when you're using an animal structure if you're not using an animal structure well you simply use a name and that wouldn't be an issue so what we have here is what I call delegation, where Go is delegating to a nested structure and making available the field name for the embedded structure. And this can happen for multiple structures. If I had another structure with yet another field name that is not name, I can also use it the same way as if it was part of C. So it's almost like it's bubbling up those names, okay? I'm finding several ways of saying the same thing. That is to help you understand it. So what if I had a second city? So let's say... I added country and country had a name also. So now notice I have two field structures with the same field name. And what if I had a second city, which also had string for the name, it had state, it embeds, and it also embeds country. So how might I use this? Notice that state and country both have a name field. If I try to use a city variable, which name should it offer me? So let's see. So when you embed a struct is when you do not use this name. And so you just use a struct itself. So let's try and get CD2. So with CD2, we know this gives us an error because we're not saying which field we want to initialize. And instead, we are just using the fields in the order in which they were declared. And of course, we are missing the country field. So let's say that oh, we want to use a state field because that's a field. We want to use string, which is a field. So we name in the field and let's also name country. So we want a country field and we'll set it to this value. And we put a comma there and we need to use this. Let's call this C1. And so I do not have an error, but I don't have a name for my country. So this looks okay and I do not have an error. So what happened if I said FMT, that print F, and I said city, and now I need to specify the values I'm going to use. I want to say C1 that string represents the city name. And notice, oh, I have name being offered. But which name is this? Well, if I try to use it, you'll see I'll get a curly thing and it says, well, let's complete it. I'll see C1 that name again. And so now I get the curly braces and it says ambiguous selector name. So even though it's offered me name, because it's bubbling that up from the nested structures. And of course, it didn't offer me two, it also offered me one. You can't tell which one. So this is why it's ambiguous. So to disambiguate this, we have to say we want the one from state, that name, and we want the one from country, that name. And so now this is how you deal with ambiguity when you have anonymous structures that are embedded that have the same field name. So if we run a code, of course, we can tell this will run because we do not have a warning. And so there we go. Could take on a new line. We said we we're going to look at all different ways of initializing structs and more advanced ways. And that means that we can specify which field of the structure we want to initialize. We can put them on multiple lines. 
We can leave out fields that we do not want to initialize. We also talk about nesting structures, how we can have structures within structures. And because we can name which field we want to initialize, well, the nested structures just get the default initialization. But if we want to use them, we can also name those by specifying that we need to use a value of that structure type. And then when it comes to anonymous structure, we said that if we have unique types, basically the type only shows up once, we can leave out the name. Of course, if I wanted my CT to have another string value, I could not leave both of these as anonymous because then it really doesn't make any sense. And I would encourage you not to really use anonymous basic type. Here it's clear, this is a state and this is a country. So I'm not worried about just typing the word state again, just so I can say I have a name struct. Because as we will see, you can also do public versus private field name for a structure. And so if you had to do a public field name, you'd simply call it state. So why type it twice? You can leave it as anonymous. So this is okay when you have types that are named. In this case, if it's a built-in type, it's not so clear what is the purpose of this. So I would say, go ahead and give this a name or name that field. Don't use anonymous fields for basic types. And then we saw that if you have nested structure or embedded structures, where there's an ambiguity resulting from the name that are bubbled up to the parent structure that you can disambiguate it by just being explicit about which structure you want to use. So that's it for this lecture. Now, we don't have an exercise for the end of this lecture because the material we cover really is just about initialization, nested structure. And while there's new material, there's no really way to come up with an exercise just to demonstrate that how you can disambiguate structures or you can nest structures. And so the concept is more important, I think, here. And an exercise really wouldn't help that much. If you really don't get it here, you should spend more time reading the language specification and also definitely looking at this video and other material on Golang structures. In the next lecture, we'll wrap up section five and then we'll have a lab. That's it. Take care and see you in the next lecture. Bye. So for your lab exercise, what you have is what I call a people database, and you'll be running some stats on that people database. So I give you a file, a comma separated value file, representing information about individuals. I want you to write a Go program that does the following. It reads the record from this data file. So what does a record look like? Well, it's comma separated value. And so this represents the information for one person. And specifically, what you have is the name of a person. You have their first name, last name, social security number, their gender, male or female, their age, and then you have their salary. And this goes on and you have quite a bit of records. But you read the file. How do you specify the file? Well, it must be specified as an argument to your program. You need to examine each line to turn each string into the appropriate type. And once you store that information, now I'd like you to iterate over those records or person database and figure out what the total number of records, the minimum salary, maximum salary, average salary. And I want you to do this by gender. So you should be able to say how many records are for male, how many for female, what the minimum salary is and maximum salary is for women and men and their average salary. And that's it. Okay, just calculate some stats. And there's some requirements and things that you must do, of course. You must use a struct at least, at least one struct. You should use more than one files to make your program easier to read. And then remember that oh, you can use go install to install your package and go doc to get the name of your... If you want some additional data to test with, I got my data from Macro. You can certainly go generate some more data and so on. And the solution, of course, is in the solution directory. And I can run the solution so you can see. And I pass the people that sees comma separated value file, my input data file. And as you can see, my program figure out how many are female, the minimum salary, maximum salary, average salary, and same thing for males.